Welcome. This is a chat between Dick and Sharon, publishers and co-founders of LA Progressive. And we're going to be talking about wokeness and a little bit about critical race theory. But the whole thing is going to be about a 10-minute video. Um, Dick, you want to say anything before we begin? Yeah, I'm excited. This is our first effort. We got some new equipment and we've talked forever how we're going to have some conversations between the two of us and then eventually branch out and, and have interviews with some of our mini authors. So I'm excited about it. A nice thing to do on a Saturday morning. Great. And so let me just first introduce us. Uh, this is Dick Price and I'm Sharon Kyle. We're a husband and wife team. And like I've already said, we co-founded the LA Progressive, which is a daily digital publication. You can find it at laprogressive.com. Okay, so um, let's just talk a little bit about wokeness, Dick. Do you want to talk to me about how that term is sort of being vilified on the right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, you hear all kinds of right wingers currently uh, uh, damning whatever policy is coming down the pike by calling it woke. Here in here in Los Angeles, our our vaunted. Uh, Sheriff Alex Villanueva is forever calling woke politicians and woke systems, and, and it's damning it. Uh, and uh, it's a good way to, uh, it's a good way uh, of, uh, it's, it's a, a good way to propagandize without meaning. Uh, there's never much explanation of what they mean by woke. It's just, it's a bad thing. It's like, it's like the, the make America great, again, hats that had no policy with them, but they were an easy thing to say, and you could put it on a, on a, on a baseball cap and, and rouse people up, and that's what's happening with woke. Right. So it seems like there's been a concerted effort to take the word woke and turn it into a pejorative. Right. And the, and the same thing seems to, seems to have happened with critical race theory. I'm going to move on to another slide and ask you about your early um, childhood education, um, let's say elementary school. So I'm gonna go on to a slide here. Tell me um, something about this slide and what you learned in elementary school. The strongest memory I have, well, I do have a memory of forced elementary school in Crystal, Minnesota and a wonderful teacher, Mrs. Golden. Uh, who, uh, who had me get up in front of the class and pretend to be Eugene McCarthy, who was running for Senate. And I was running against uh, the, the, the big athlete, Donnie Thompson, a big, big tough guy. And, and I, uh, I won the argument and I got elected. Uh, that's really what I remember. I, I know you want to talk about what history did we learn about slavery. And, and Mrs. Golden was a, a quite good teacher. I don't specifically remember being taught very deeply about slavery, certainly. Right. Yeah, well, this is a, sort of a, a comical um, um, image, a cartoon that kind of brings to the fore how much of our history is dominated by the victors. So those who, who won, they are the ones that get to tell the story. And it says, steady on lads, tis a perilous trek over 300 yards of water for not but our freedom. But I assure you, this will be all in the history books. So I wanna talk a little bit about that left side where we have George Washington. There's a famous painting of George Washington crossing the Delaware during the Revolutionary War period. What is not captured in this cartoon image is the real painting has an image of George Washington's slave. George Washington was an enslaver, and he in fact had a slave helping to uh, row this team across the Delaware. We didn't, when I was growing up, never was it mentioned that George Washington was an enslaver. And it wasn't until uh, you and I took a trip to, um, um, Mount Vernon. Thank you, Mount Vernon. And we actually saw the slave quarters. They, they rebuilt the slave quarters and they say they, they tried to recreate the, the environment that the slaves lived in. But George Washington enslaved hundreds of people. And obviously um, this 300 yards of water that they had to cross in order to gain freedom did not get freedom for the person who George Washington had right in that boat with him who was a slave. 
the, yeah, so so I so I remember that day when we looked at the slave quarters at Mount Vernon, and they were it was a, an underground bunker uh, with just one one door, one one opening with no door, uh, a dirt floor. It looked absolutely abysmal, and it was one of those many times that I was with my black wife when when something when racism was put in her face and her shoulders would just crush down. It. It, it, was, it was quite impressive. I, I can say a, a thing about the critical race theory, that's, that's another thing like woke that's being uh, uh, damned uh, without much understanding. I mean, certainly critical race theory is, is a, a whole evolved ac academic uh, discipline, but really what it means is if you look at any policy or part of history, American history or, or action that's going on, and you don't consider the role racism plays in creating what's going on, then you're missing the boat. That's basically what it is. And, and people who want to teach critical race theory, what they want to teach actually is honest history. And that was what, what Nicole Hannah-Jones was attempting to do with the 1619 Project. And the 1619 project became a target for the right. Another attempt to um, erase or make invisible all of the things that were associated with race in this country, with blackness in this country. So it's really very much anti-black and also anti-native. So there's been a there, there's been an arc of advancement from the protests around Trayvon Martin's murder to the, the murder of George Floyd. A lot of, a lot of protest, a lot of attention played to inequality, to police violence against black men, uh, uh, some advancement, uh, some, some bills coming forward. Maybe some of it didn't accomplish a lot, but I would say a lot of people who look more like me and less like Sharon we're paying more attention to the role racism plays in our society. And what we've been seeing lately now is the flashback, the, pu the pushback, because there is a, a, a part of our country, a large part of, or maybe not a large part, there's a part of our white populace that's in power, in privilege, in, in places of, of, of luxury and, 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 and decision, who want to keep it that way. They may pay lip service to democracy and say, what a wonderful thing and, and the, uh, we the people. But in truth, that only goes so far as they get to stay in power. And what we've been seeing is with these, these more attention played to the role of racism, inequality, that, that uh, democracy can get kicked to the curb if it, if it gets in the road of the powerful staying powerful. Yes, so I just wanna say something uh, briefly about critical race theory. You and I have been fortunate enough to go to uh, critical race theory symposiums that are conducted here in Los Angeles at UCLA Law School, where Kimberly Crenshaw teaches and she also teaches at NYU. Um, so critical race theory was a theory that um, uh, Professor Bell back in, um, I'm gonna say maybe 25, 30 years ago, in New York talked about the role that race plays in the establishment of our laws. It's really a theory that was um, used to teach law students, certainly not in um, elementary education or even secondary education. It's law school theory. However, I believe that there is an opportunity to use critical race theory on a variety of levels. The problem is that the term critical race theory or CRT has once again been damned by the right, has now become a pejorative and without really explaining what it is. Dick, do you wanna say anything about some of the things that you learned or you know, the exposure that you've had to critical race theory going to the UCLA critical race theory symposiums? Well, that's what I was saying. It, it, it is really a, a well-evolved academic pursuit uh, uh, that's certainly valuable. It, it is all about uh, how, how racism has influenced the creation of many laws from the very beginning of our country. When at the beginning of our country, only white property men could vote. 
So certainly it wasn't women couldn't vote, white men without property couldn't vote, and never mind slaves even being considered. So from the very beginning of our country, uh, racism has played a major role in, in constructing our, our voting systems. And, and, and that's a part of what the pushback is going on now. I mean, how blatant is it that, that our, many places in our country, many states in our country are doing their level best to exclude as many black people from voting as they can? Uh, sometimes that those efforts are kind of under the cover and you can barely see them. But lately, there's a great boldness about it. They, they, want, to, they want to disenfranchise black people. And, and, and the concern is in the next two elections, later this year and then two and a half years from now, that if, this, if these efforts actually do create a coup, our, demo, our democracy is in grave danger. That's uh, right. Right? Yes, yes, that's right. And so and one thing that I kind of want to make clear is, so Dick, you're saying that, that they want to vilify um, these terms, they want to um, make invisible the role that race has played in the establishment of this country, in the building and the development of this country. But the reason that they're trying to sow these seeds of division is really for a purpose. And that purpose is to maintain power. And the purpose is also to maintain a fertile ground because not everybody is a virulent racist. <laughs> not every white person is a virulent racist. Obviously, you and I are married. And so I wouldn't be married to you if I felt that that was true. But I do feel that there are a lot of especially white people who don't have a deep understanding of the role that racism has played in creating the kind of country that we have. And without that understanding, they are ripe for sort of being led or through the use of propaganda to believe things that just aren't true. So in order to do that, one of the techniques that they're using right now is banning books, keeping people ignorant. I love this cartoon. We ban books, not guns. Well, what about books about guns? <laughs> I mean, they, they take a very serious a uh, very serious issue and make light of it, but we know with the banning of books, what that does to a democracy. Yeah, that, I think that's a, an excellent point. And one ridiculous extreme of that is the state of Florida banned 50 math books for elementary students because somehow they mentioned race. And, and, and the purpose is exactly, uh, many white people are not aware of the role of slavery and racism and Jim Crow played on a, on a big part, pop, part of our populace. And there are people who wanna keep it that way because if people saw a lot of those pictures of the hundreds of slaves laying down in the bottom of a slave ship or, or, or the, Mount, or the Mount, uh, Mount Vernon slave quarters, if they really absorbed what, what's going on, they would have a great deal of understanding about why black people are off, oftentimes up in arms about their treatment at the hands of police, institutions, government. They would see the inequality and there's people that don't want us to see that inequality. Right, so they wanna maintain that what happened back in uh, the colonial times up through 1865, that was uh, 150 years ago. We should be beyond that now. But what black people, um, it's it, particularly African Americans who have um, who are the descendants of slaves. What we maintain is that it wouldn't be it the art the argument that they make that that was 150 years ago. That could be true if everything stopped in 1865, but it didn't stop. We had Jim Crow. We had. Uh, lynchings, thousands of lynchings. And, and Brian Stevenson did, a, did, a, did an awesome job in Montgomery, Alabama, yeah. where he put together um, a memorial to the thousands, thousands, <laughs> thousands, I, I think more than 4,000 that they have been able to document of black people who were lynched over the years. Ida B. Wells, that she was a journalist and she made that her life's work to bring to the attention of the American public, but mainstream media didn't even want to share um, Ida B. Wells' articles. And these were things that were happening well beyond 
the um, Emancipation Proclamation. Yeah, that was another crushing moment when my black wife's shoulders fell down when we spent several hours on, on, on the, the museum in Montgomery, Alabama, where they had these big stones with, with the names of the people who were lynched in every county uh, around the country, hundreds and hundreds of people. It was a, it was a, a startling display. What? It was Thousands. a star, star, startling display. Yeah, yeah. And you, so, you know, you say my shoulders go down and they do. And you have empathy for me, but you also have feelings about that and it impacts you as well. I've always been interested on the role um, or the impact, the negative impact on white people. I cannot imagine that taking a child to witness a lynching did not cause PTSD. You know, everyone is laughing and smiling. We have hundreds of postcards. Even the people, the post, the, the United States Postal Service delivered these postcards, which were actual photographs of horrendous lynchings, torture, burning of bodies, bringing children to this event. I cannot accept that those children were not emotionally and psychologically damaged. So, so the, you know, you and I have talked, I mean, one of the, the things that has been most profound in the two decades that I've been embedded in your black family. And so I have an extended family of lots of black people. Wasn't so much about the slave ships or 1619 or, or emancipation or Jim Crow or, or the lynchings that followed that. It was the daily grind, the, the weathering of black people by the, the, the indignities, small and large, that black people face every day today. Uh, the, the, this, I mean, we laugh about the talk that black parents give their black children and particularly their black sons, but I guarantee you there's no white talk. You know, there's no talk that you have to watch out for policemen and stand up straight and, and pull up your pants or, or you might get killed. There's just no such talk because there's no such need for it. Or, or uh, I mean, it's it's uh, anytime anytime there is a, a, a bad news about somebody getting shot. I mean, Sharon is concerned that it would be her brother or her son. She used to be, or perhaps still is, terribly concerned when her when her son, who's a lifelong elementary school teacher, would drive into South LA, and she was always worried that the police would get him if the gangs didn't get him. I think she still worries about that. And that's, and that's a weathering to a certain part of our populace. Right. And ultimately the last slide that I wanna show is um, the John Lewis Voting Rights Bill, which is what you kind of alluded to and you may have mentioned this. So that bill died. And what I believe drives these seeds of division that are sown, what drives it is a desire to maintain power. So we have a Republican party that is essentially all white and they are confident that if all people of color had the opportunity to engage in the franchise, that those people in power would lose their seats. Dick, you wanna say anything before we close on that topic? Yeah, so, so what's going on with this denial of voting rights is there's, there's part of our populace, part of our white populace, part of our powerful white populace, part of our right-wing populace that wants to prevent multiracial pluralism. That is, you know, all Americans living together equally, commingling, uh, everybody has the same, same shot at good things. And there's part of our populace that, that is not standing for that. And that's really what's going on here. That's right. So thank you. I'm going to stop sharing right now. And we're going to go back to, uh, we're going to pause our and, and stop our recording. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. This is Dick and Sharon of LA Progressive. And we'll see you next time.